as we sing this next song, it's talking about God's favor being upon you and upon your family. That's something that we need to pray for protection over. For God's favor to be upon our family, over our children, for not this generation, but for generations and generations to come. So as we sing this next song, I just want you to sing that and to believe that, that his presence is going to be over you, over your family, over every generation that's to come.
is for you. He 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 is for you. Can make a person. He is for me. 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 children. Yes, I did put a hedge of protection around you. And that hedge is meant to guide you, to protect you. To give you the direction whenever you do not know which way to go. And that same hedge of protection is also a place where the Holy Spirit will hover. So this morning, trust, trust that hedge of protection to guide you, to direct you. This morning, put your marriages in that hedge of protection. Walk in it. Seek direction from it. Place your children and their children and their children in that hedge and trust it, pray that hedge around them. Pray that hedge around them.
in case you're not familiar with all that went on this morning, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it talks about the different kinds of gifts of the Holy Spirit. And of course, the Lord used my wife this morning in words of wisdom and knowledge, of course, to bring about what God wanted to accomplish today. So she was allowing the Holy Spirit to lead her this morning in that, and I'm so thankful for her obedience in that. And more than anything here this morning, and we prayed it in our circle, we prayed on Wednesday nights, we pray it with the, the team as we pray together with the team, that more than anything else, we want God's will in this place. Because He can take a moment like that and do more ministry than I can do in a year. And He can do it in a moment. Because by His power, He can change our hearts and our minds and give us the strength that we need and the empowerment we need and speak something supernatural to each one of us. So I welcome the Lord's presence and His Spirit and what He wants to speak and He wants to do. If any of that seems a little odd to you and you would like to visit with me about it, I would gladly visit with you and show you in the Scripture how it all fits God's Word. And I know it may be something different than you've ever experienced before, but I, I'd gladly love to show you. Don't, don't be scared of it. Don't just wonder what happened, but give me an opportunity to share if, you're, if you have concerns about it. Because I really believe God's wanting to do some supernatural work in our body. And not only does he want to, but we want to let him. Is anybody okay with letting God move? Okay, let me ask again. Is anybody okay with letting God move in our church? Yes. We want his will more than anything else. I want his will more than life and breath. I desire him more than life and breath. Well, it is good to see you this morning. And you are looking good. You are welcome. And I'm glad you received that, Larry. Glad you received that. You are looking good, though, today. We, we welcome you today. We're so thankful you're here. And I'm very thankful that God's presence is here. Man, I feel His presence so real even now. And His love is so real even now. Do you have a need? Is there somebody here that has a need? You just raise your hand and say, I, I need God to do a miracle for me today. Okay, anybody else? You just need a miracle. All right, all right. I see some hands here, some there. Right here. Okay, did you guys see the hands that went up? We're going to stop one more time, and I want you to go to those people right now around you. If you believe that Christ can do a miracle for them, I want you to surround them right now. And we had some in the back. Richard, if you could help me back there. They had their hands up. Melissa, if you don't mind to help back there with Richard, please. Okay, did anybody else have their hand up that I've missed here today? Anybody else need a miracle today that need God just to do a work? So, Father, we come to you together as a church body. And, Lord, these hands that have been raised this morning that said, I need a miracle. Father, we're believing you for that miracle even now. We're believing for that miracle for each one of these cir circumstances, situations, needs, whatever it is, Lord, that they need a miracle in, Lord. I believe you for it. And we're agreeing together as a church body that this would be done in Jesus' name, God, that these miracles would be met, these needs would be met, this miracle would be done, that your Holy Spirit and power would flow through each and every life this morning as you so desire. We pray this in your name, and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Very good. Thank you for being the church with me and helping me out this morning. And I'm believing for great reports of what God has done real soon. We've been going through a process of learning what the Lord wants us to learn. And basically, we've been taken from Matthew 28, 18 through 20, the mission of what we've been called to do as a church body. And of course, we know that Jesus came and told the disciples, I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. And he said, therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who's supposed to be making disciples? 
That's me, right? Can you say, that's me? Not Darren, but that's... Say your name, okay? <laughs> all right, okay. Anyway, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we know that our mission is to go and make disciples. And he said, when we do that, he's going to be with us through this whole process. And of course, we also know what he said here. He said, uh, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands. What we've been going over the last several weeks is the commands. And they're, they're foundational commands is what I want to call them. Because most everything else that we learn throughout Scripture, it kind of comes from these commands and these, these words, if you will. First off, we've, we learned about love the Lord your God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. We also learned about loving one another. Look at your neighbor and says, God wants me to love you. And I will, and I do. <laughs> also, look at your neighbor and say, God wants me to pray for those who hurt me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's another one of those commands. God wants me to pray for those people who hurt me. That's pretty tough, right? That was one of those tough messages. When we got that one, that was a little tougher. But he also says, God wants me to repent. All right? These are the commands. And, of course, last week we knew to believe that Jesus is in the Father. Basically to know that Jesus, when he came, he was Emmanuel with us. He was God with us. And we talked about him being from the beginning of times. Today, though, you guys are going to be real excited about this command. Everybody is pumped, stoked, ready to go with this one today, right? All right, I am convinced. So let's go ahead and go. So... This one here is, take up your cross and follow me. Everybody said, wait a minute. I thought this was going to be one of those stoked ones, right? This one will be one of those exciting ones. Well, Matthew 16 and 24 says this. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Or a lot of versions says, deny yourself. You must give up your own way, take your cross, and follow me. Now, I talked about some of those others being hard ones to where we got to pray for our enemies and where we got to love one another and we got to love each other, your neighbor as yourself. I talked about those being rough, but this one might be even harder because this one here talks about denying me. Denying me. Giving up my way. You know the old saying, my way or the highway? You can't say that anymore when you do this. Now it's our Father's way and no other way. As we begin to look at this process. Jesus said to his disciples, if you want to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. Has anybody ever looked up the definition of selfish before? You ever looked that definition up? Because sometimes whenever I go in life and I go through a process and God brings me to myself and I will look at what he sees in the mirror, sometimes... It's selfish. Do you know that preachers can even be selfish? Do you know that? Oh, you didn't know that? Did you know that we're just like everybody else? We can be selfish. And in fact, I've even told people sometimes right out whenever they'd say that God's asked me to leave and, and go to do ministry somewhere else. I would say, I want to bless you to do what God wants you to do. But if I'm going to be selfish about it, I'd really like you to stay. Uh, I think you did, but you did anyway. Selfish is of a person, action, or motive, lacking consideration for others. 
concerned chiefly with one's own profit, personal profit, or pleasure. Selfish is lacking consideration for others, concerned chiefly with one's own personal profit or pleasure. It's about me. I didn't burn them. I do have them on this morning. It's kind of like I am a pretty big deal. I got my dill pickle socks on again because sometimes we feel like we are a pretty big deal. I really need to stop here just a minute. And I really want us to think about this. How many things do we do that we've considered our Heavenly Father in those things? And how many things do we do that we just do because it's what we want to do? I'm going to say that again. How many things do we do because... We've considered our Heavenly Father in the process of doing that. Or we do what we do just because it's what we want. Denying yourself includes overcoming the persistent fleshly demands of the body. I could probably underline that and bold that. Denying yourself includes overcoming the persistent fleshly demands of the body, also known as the carnal self of of the natural man, and bringing them into submission to God's Word so that you don't give in to sin. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desire of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them. As I'm saying this, I already know that there's things in our minds sometimes as we're preaching in this way of things that we know that is not what God wants. You don't have to raise your hand. But we know some of the things that that we do are not what God wants. We know that they're not of His desire. We know that they're not of His will. And what He's saying here, if you want to be my follower, you need to lay these things down on the cross, nail them to the cross, let those things die. Let them be gone. Let them be no longer a part of your life. And when you find yourself in this struggle, basically say, God, I need your help. God, I need your strength. Help me to overcome these things that I know I need to nail to the cross. I know in men's encounter and also in, uh, what do they call the women's encounter? Uh, Ashes to beauty. I know that there's a time during that time that you're gone that weekend that you take these things that you know that no longer should be a part of your life and you physically nail them to a cross. And I remember years ago when they first started it, and I went kind of to some of the first ones, they had flash paper. And basically with this flash paper, you'd write it down on flash paper and they'd light it on fire and it'd just go poof and be gone. Basically, that's what needs to happen in our lives and we need to give it to our Heavenly Father, and let it be gone. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's lead in every underlined, bold, circle it, highlight it, make it real, every part of our lives. Every part of our lives. Let His Holy Spirit lead us. Let Him direct us. Even when we go to Walmart and somebody does something we don't like, (laughs) I love this part. Um, Okay, you ever been in a place to where you just got, uh, what can I say, so angry you could choke them? I'm trying to be really nice because there's a lot of things floating around up here, okay? Have you ever stopped and thought about why did I get so angry? Why did I get so upset with this situation or or this person? Why did I get so put out with them? 
And usually if we would do a little bit of research, it's because they were in my way and they were messing up what I needed to do. I needed to be somewhere and they just wouldn't move. Come on now. You can surely do better at that in the checkout line. Let me help you. You know what I mean? We feel that way because so many times, if we will really search our heart, whenever we feel so angry, we'll find out it's because it's about me. It's about what I think is best. It's about what I want or what I need to do. Or those people on the road that go 45 miles an hour and there's nowhere to pass them and you've you got to get wherever you're going like yesterday. I know I had a, a youth pastor that was serving with me in a, in a church. He said, I wish I had torpedoes on the front of my car and I could just push the button and blow them out of the way. You know what I'm saying? We feel those thoughts, but what the Lord's wanting to do is He's wanting to take this Word and He's wanting us to begin to crucify our flesh, our desires, deny ourselves, and think about someone else. Maybe it's a good thing they're driving 45, otherwise they would wreck. And really, it might have cost five minutes at most. Because if you ever pass that person doing 45, you blow around them, and then you stop at the stoplight, and there they are, right in your tail. That you really, all you did was got upset. You see, a large crowd was following Jesus one day. And he turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciples, you must, by comparison, now I want you to understand this, by comparison, hate everyone else. Now this isn't telling you to hate everyone else, and we'll go to that in a minute. Your father and mother, oh, good, I get to hate them. No, that's not what it's saying here. Your wife and your children, no, we prayed over the family today. Brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciples. So basically, if you do not, and if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So in this, Jesus' statement he was making here that we hate our father and mother must be seen in uh, relation to the whole Scripture. His point is not that we are to be heartless towards our family, only that we must love him more. Let me give you an example of that. When Peggy and I knew that God wanted us to go to Texas, we just knew it's what the Lord wanted us to do. And I'll be real honest with you, it was really hard on some of my family members. My dad was struggled. I've not seen dad struggle so much as I did whenever we were selling everything. I mean, we were selling it all, and we were moving to Texas to live in an apartment just because God told us to, okay? Loopy people. But we went because we knew it's exactly what God wanted us to do. Now, do I hate my father and my mother? Absolutely not. I love them. In fact, the Word tells me to honor them. The Word tells me to love my children. And the Word tells me to love each other and love you. But what he's saying in this here is our focus and our desire has to make him number one. This scripture is talking about him becoming the number one in your life, in every part of your life, in every aspect of your life. That he becomes your life and your breath. That every being that you do, you do because you love him and you desire his will. You're saying, I no longer want Darren's will, but I want God's will. Of course, put your name where Darren is there. We must forget that included in Jesus' condition for a follower that must hate his father and mother, is the condition that he likewise hate even his own life. You see, and he doesn't want us to hate our own life. Jesus is not teaching an emotional hatred of one's parents any more than he's teaching of a self-hatred. The emphasis is on self-denial, an absolute surrender, an immediate 
following of Jesus' instructions to carry your cross. In other words, die to self and do whatever the Father wants us to do. You know, as I've grown in this, and we all have to grow in this, because I want to be honest with you, it doesn't, it's a process in each one of our lives. But as I've grown in this, I've found myself not being quite as angry as often. The more I have Christ and the less I have me, I find myself not being as angry as often. I find myself in a position to where actually I begin to think about why this is going on. Why they're going through this process of, of looking at every can three different ways before they just beep. And look at it again. And then look at the sack and look at it and then put it in the sack. They're thorough. And I'm trying to make some light things here, but there's some serious things here. There's some serious areas in our lives that God's wanting to deal with, and He's wanting us to consider Him before we consider us. To consider His will and His purpose for our lives. The emphasis is on self-denial and absolute surrender. The cross is a representation of what had to be done for our salvation. What is the Father asking us to do that others would know Him? You see, this whole journey of discipleship is about others knowing Him. Not only about us being discipled, but it's about me reaching out and helping someone else know Christ and helping them grow in Christ. This whole process is not even about me now because you get... Here's the deal. I accepted Christ in my life. I'm ready, okay? If I was to die today right here in front of you, which would be kind of a weird deal, but anyway, if that happened, I'm ready, okay? You don't have to cry. I graduated. Woohoo! You know what I'm saying? But... What about the person who does not know Him? You see, when we place things on the cross, when we deny ourselves and we carry our cross and become what Christ wants us to be, then our life represents Him. And in that representation of Him, other lives are changed. Not just by our words, but by our actions. By who we are in everything that we are and in our entire being. Self-denial for Christians means renouncing oneself as the center of existence. In other words, it's saying, I am not the center of existence. Oh my goodness. I, maybe we need to just repeat that one. Now, I'm not going to do that to you. I might. I want to. But what I won't. But you really need to say, I am not the center of existence. It's not all about me. It's not all about what I think is best or what I want. You see, self-denial as a Christian means renouncing oneself as the center of existence, which goes against our nature. And recognize that the old self is dead and the new life is now hidden in Christ our God. Since you have been raised to life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in a place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of this earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, I want you to hear this, when Christ who is in your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in His glory. Let me give you a quick, quick example of that Scripture before we go on. Whenever I shine Christ, and it helps change a part of your life, when I am living Christ, sharing Christ, being Christ, and it changes a part of your life, then I get to share and celebrate what God done is, has done in your life and what God is doing in your life. I get to be a part of that celebration because guess what? He used me. I was His vessel. 
That's where I need my yabba dabba doo socks on. I should have wore a yabba dabba doo and a pickle. Because it's like, woohoo! There's nothing like, nothing like God using you and you see someone come closer to the Lord because of your life or what you've done or said, the way you've been about your life and they know Him. There's nothing greater to see people grow to know Him. So, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is idolater. Worship the things of this world. You see, to take up the cross, Jesus is calling his disciples. Say that's. Thank you. Jesus is calling his disciples. Oh, that's that's kind of cool. You've seen those memes? Anyway. (laughs) I'm sorry. Just sometimes. Anyway. Thank you. To engage in radical self-denial. The cross meant only one thing to the first century person. And that was death. Now, in this, as we talk about, there was only one thing, and that was death. What that is meaning is very simply, death to my will. Do you remember the picture that we have of this? Jesus gave us a picture of what this looks like. As he was giving his entirety, his words were, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He not only died on the cross for our sins, but he denied himself for us. He offered forgiveness when we really don't deserve it. Is there anybody here that's been good enough to deserve it? I don't think so. There's none of us that have enough or good enough or can be good enough to deserve the grace and the mercy that our Father has given us. And he said it this way, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sometimes we need to take that phrase and not just carry it in our pocket, but carry it in our heart. And when we come to that situation to where it's an impossible situation, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And even if they know what they're doing, they don't know what they're doing. You understand what I'm saying? Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. You see, that's picking up the cross. That's denying ourselves and where he wants us to be. And then Galatians reiterates this theme of death to sin and self and rising to walk in a new life through Christ. And it says it this way in Ephesians 2 and 20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. I'm going to ask you a question. Please don't raise your hands. How many of us can say, I've still got a little old self that needs to be crucified? My old self have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. God wants me to love Him with all my heart. Everything that's within me. The first and the greatest commandment. And the second one, love it. It It's like that. Love your neighbor as yourself. He asked me to love you. To love one another. In fact, when we love one another, the world will know that we're his disciples because of our love for one another. That's why the enemy loves for a church to bicker. Because it... Begins to taint the the representation of Christ. But we're to love one another. And we're to pray for those who hurt us. As we repent when we do wrong. 
and come to know Him. And we know that He is God with us. And as we take up the cross and follow Him. As you look at all these statements, can you see a theme here in the commands that God has given us? That our Lord Jesus has given us? The commands He's wanting to teach us? Do you see a theme in all of these? Can I give you kind of a statement or a theme here that's in all of these? It's all about Him. And even though when I say it's all about Him and it's not about me, sometimes we think, but I want it to be about me. Let me be real honest with you this morning. The happiest and the greatest times of my life is whenever I was the least about me. And the most about Him. There's more satisfaction in doing that than being a billionaire. I promise you. And if you get the chance to be a billionaire, you'd let me know if I was right. And don't forgive me. Please pay your tithes. Just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. Maybe too much fun. Went too far over the line. But, but this, is, this is true in what I'm saying. The greatest times of my life and the times I've been, been the happiest, and I've, I've lived the other life. I lived the time of the parties, and I've lived the time of these other things in my life that were not of God. But the greatest times, bar none, was the times whenever I get to pray with someone. I get to share Christ with someone. I go to Texas and I didn't really enjoy door to door. It wasn't just, yeah. But I did it because it's what God wanted me to do. And through that process, I got to know some people and know some guys. And I'm looking forward. I'm so praying that Dwayne gets to come in August. He's planning on coming. Because Dwayne's that guy, that one of those guys that I met at Texas, that I just... I got to see God pour into. I got to see God just do miraculous things. And now He's studying for ministry and moving forward in ministry. And it's so exciting to talk to Him on the phone how God's using Him and the things of that nature. There's nothing greater. And you say, well, it's because you're a preacher. No! I wasn't a preacher in Texas. I was just there. And that's just me. I'm not even a preacher now. I'm still just me. The point of this is, yes, there's things God has to do to grow me, but what He's wanting to challenge each of us in this morning is to say, Father, I I want to follow You. I want to set my desires to the side. And I think this is beyond a salvation call this morning. I want to set my desires to the side. And I want to do your perfect will in my life. I want you to be more in control of me. And my direction and the way I need to go. Than just what I want. Would you stand with me? This is going to be personal, and this is how we're going to close this up. As we do this, I want to say, first off, you're welcome to come and lay things before the Lord. If you feel like that that's what He wants you to do, you're welcome to do that. But this morning, I'm going to let this become personal to you. As we take just a moment here to pray, I'm going to ask you to consider what we've asked this day. And if you're willing to say, God, I want you to take all of me. I'm going to ask you just to make that commitment to him this morning.
in your own way, however you need to do it. And if he tells you to come forward, you better come forward because that's you saying, God, I want to be what you want me to be and do what you want me to do. But if not, in your own way, just make that commitment today. Father, as we come to you this morning, I know usually, Lord, you have me do an altar time, but today I know that you've asked me to do this. Because, Lord, this is a this is something we need to do as individuals. This is not because of grandma or grandpa or this is not because of anybody else, but this is me. This is us as an individual making a decision to say, I want to do your will, Lord. So, Father, I pray that as each and every one that says, I want to do your will. God, as they say this this morning, I pray that you'd pour your spirit out upon their lives this week. And God, that they would notice a difference in everything that they do. They'd notice that, that they desire you more. They're hungry for you more. God, that they would notice that, that you are giving direction to their lives. And that they're taking time to consider your direction for their lives. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit and your power would be with this church. Lord, that we could not only fulfill these commands, but Lord, that we could teach these to others that they might know you in a greater way. Now, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit and power be with each and every one this morning. In Jesus' name. Lord, we do love you today. So thankful for your presence that has just been so real today. Your Holy Spirit that has hovered and anointed over this family. And Lord, don't ever let us take that for granted. Don't let us walk into this service and it just be that and not just ex know and expect that your presence is going to be here. Lord, we're so thankful for your hand upon us, your direction that you give us, the love that you just pour over us again and again. We love you, Lord. Lord, you continue in days to come the work that you've started here because I believe there was a work that started here. Lord, you continue that in the days to come. And in those days, whenever we, when Satan wants to lie to us and say, man, you were just doing what you do. Holy Spirit, remind us that um, we said some things in faith and by faith today. We made commit commitments in faith and by faith, knowing that you're going to walk us through it. You're going to direct us through it. And Lord, the words you kept giving me for Gavin is that we would all just lean into you. Instruct us in that this week, God. Show us ways that we can lean into you. And Lord, I know there's a work that you want to do in Reuben's life. Lord, we, he, we so expect and want for you to do it in a visible, physical way. 
But Lord, just the words you gave me earlier is there's a work that you were going to start on the inside of him. And it's going to be shown on the outside. Lord, we trust you with it. Because Lord, as I've said time and time again, and I know, Lord, you're faithful. The commitments that we made with our spouse and with our families today um, are commitments that we know that you are faithful in as we lean into you. And help us do that this week. We love you, Lord. We love this church family. We love your presence. And we love, God, that whenever we walk out of these doors, that that same presence goes with us. We love you, Lord. Amen, and so be it.